Chapter forty eight, part three of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume four, by Edward Gibbon. Chapter forty eight. Succession and Characters of the Greek Emperors Part Three. The Russians, who have borrowed from the Greeks the greatest part of their civil and ecclesiastical policy, preserved, till the last century, a singular institution in the marriage of the Tsar. They collected, not the virgins of every rank and of every province, a vain and romantic idea, but the daughters of the principal nobles, who awaited in the palace the choice of their sovereign. It is affirmed that a similar method was adopted in the nuptials of Theophilus. With a golden apple in his hand, he slowly walked between the two lines of contending beauties. His eye was detained by the charms of Acacia, and, in the awkwardness of the first declaration, the prince could only observe that, in this world, women had been the cause of much evil. "'And surely, sir,' she pertly replied, "'they have likewise been the occasion of much good.' "'This affectation of unseasonable wit "'displeased the imperial lover. "'He turned aside in disgust. "'Acacia concealed her mortification in a convent, "'and the modest silence of Theodora "'was rewarded with the golden apple. "'She deserved the love, "'but did not escape the severity of her lord.' From the palace garden he beheld a vessel deeply laden and steering into the port. On the discovery that the precious cargo of Syrian luxury was the property of his wife, he condemned the ship to the flames with a sharp reproach that her avarice had degraded the character of an empress into that of a merchant. Yet his last choice entrusted her with the guardianship of the empire and her son Michael, who was left an orphan in the fifth year of his age. The restoration of images, and the final extirpation of the iconoclasts, has endeared her name to the devotion of the Greeks, but in the fervour of religious zeal. Theodora entertained a grateful regard for the memory and salvation of her husband. After thirteen years of a prudent and frugal administration, she perceived the decline of her influence. But the second Irene imitated only the virtues of her predecessor. Instead of conspiring against the life or government of her son, she retired without a struggle, though not without a murmur, to the solitude of private life, deploring the ingratitude, the vices, and the inevitable ruin of the worthless youth. Among the successors of Nero and Elagabalus we have not, hitherto, found the imitation of their vices, the character of a Roman prince who considered pleasure as the object of life, and virtue as the enemy of pleasure. Whatever might have been the maternal care of Theodora in the education of Michael the Third, her unfortunate son was a king before he was a man. If the ambitious mother laboured to check the progress of reason, she could not call the ebullition of passion, and her selfish policy was justly repaid by the contempt and ingratitude of the headstrong youth. At the age of eighteen he rejected her authority, without feeling his own incapacity to govern the empire and himself. With Theodora, all gravity and wisdom retired from the court. Their place was supplied by the alternate dominion of vice and folly, and it was impossible, without fortifying the public esteem, to acquire or preserve the favour of the emperor. The millions of gold and silver which had been accumulated for the service of the state were lavished on the vilest of men, who flattered his passions and shared his pleasures. And in a reign of thirteen years, the richest of sovereigns was compelled to strip the palace and the churches of their precious furniture. Like Nero, he delighted in the amusements of the theatre, and sighed to be surpassed in the accomplishments in which he should have blushed to excel. Yet the studies of Nero in music and poetry betrayed some symptoms of a liberal taste. 
the more ignoble arts of the son of Theophilus were confined to the chariot race of the Hippodrome. The four factions which had agitated the peace still amused the idleness of the capital. For himself, the emperor assumed the blue livery. The three rival colours were distributed to his favourites, and in the file, though eager contention, he forgot the dignity of his person and the safety of his dominions. He silenced the messenger of an invasion who presumed to divert his attention in the most critical moment of the race, and by his command the importunate beacons were extinguished that too frequently spread the alarm from Tarsus to Constantinople. The most skilful charioteers obtained the first place in his confidence and esteem. Their merit was profusely rewarded. The emperor feasted in their houses, and presented their children at the baptismal font. And while he applauded his own popularity, he affected to blame the cold and stately reserve of his predecessors. The unnatural lusts which had degraded even the manhood of Nero were banished from the world. Yet the strength of Michael was consumed by the indulgence of love and intemperance. In his midnight revels, when his passions were inflamed by wine, he was provoked to issue the most sanguinary commands. And if any feelings of humanity were left, he was reduced, with the return of sense, to approve the solitary disobedience of his servants. But the most extraordinary feature in the character of Michael is the profane mockery of the religion of his country. The superstition of the Greeks might indeed excite the smile of a philosopher, but his smile would have been rational and temperate, and he must have condemned the ignorant folly of a youth who insulted the objects of public veneration. A buffoon of the court was invested in the robes of a patriarch. His twelve metropolitans, among whom the emperor was ranked, assumed their ecclesiastical garments. They used, or abused, the sacred vessels of the altar. And in their bacchanalian feasts, the Holy Communion was administered in a nauseous compound of vinegar and mustard. Nor were these impious spectacles concealed from the eyes of the city. On the day of a solemn festival, the emperor, with his bishops or buffoons, rode on asses through the street, encountered the true patriarch at the head of his clergy, and, by their licentious shouts and obscene gestures, disordered the gravity of the Christian procession. The devotion of Michael appeared only in some offence to reason or piety. He received his theatrical crowns from the statue of the Virgin, and an imperial tomb was violated for the sake of burning the bones of Constantine the iconoclast. By this extravagant conduct, the son of Theophilus became as contemptible as he was odious. Every citizen was impatient for the deliverance of his country, and even the favourites of the moment were apprehensive that a caprice might snatch away what a caprice had bestowed. In the thirtieth year of his age, and in the hour of intoxication and sleep, Michael the Third was murdered in his chamber by the founder of a new dynasty whom the emperor had risen to inequality of rank and power. The genealogy of Basil the Macedonian, if it be not the spurious offspring of pride and flattery, exhibits a genuine picture of the revolution of the most illustrious families. The Arsacides, the rivals of Rome, possessed the sceptre of the East near four hundred years. A younger branch of these Parthian kings continued to reign in Armenia, and their royal descendants survived the partition and servitude of that ancient monarchy. Two of these, Aratabanus and Calainus, escaped or retired to the court of Leo I. His bounty seated them in a safe and hospitable exile. In the province of Macedonia, Adrianople was their final settlement. During several generations they maintained the dignity of their birth, and their Roman patriotism rejected the tempting offers of the Persian and Arabian powers, who recalled them to their native country. But their splendour was insensibly clouded by time and poverty, and the father of Basil was reduced to a small farm, which he cultivated with his own hands. Yet he scorned to disgrace the blood of the Arsacides by a plebeian alliance. 
his wife, a widow of Adrianople, was pleased to count among her ancestors the great Constantine, and their royal infant was connected by some dark affinity of lineage or country with the Macedonian Alexander. No sooner was he born than the cradle of Basil, his family, and his city were swept away by an inundation of the Bulgarians. He was educated a slave in a foreign land, and in this severe discipline he acquired the hardiness of body and flexibility of mind which promoted his future elevation. In the age of youth or manhood he shared the deliverance of the Roman captives, who generously broke their fetters, marched through Bulgaria to the shores of the Euxin, defeated two armies of barbarians, embarked in the ships which had been stationed for their reception, and returned to Constantinople, from whence they were distributed to their respective homes. But the freedom of Basil was naked and destitute. His farm was ruined by the calamities of war. After his father's death, his manual labour or service could no longer support a family of orphans, and he resolved to seek a more conspicuous theatre, in which every virtue and every vice may lead to the paths of greatness. The first night of his arrival at Constantinople, without friends or money, the weary pilgrim slept on the steps of the church at St. Diomede. He was fed by the casual hospitality of a monk, and was introduced to the service of a cousin and namesake of the Emperor Theophilus, who, though himself of a diminutive person, was always followed by a train of tall and handsome domestics. Basil attended his patron to the government of Pilo Pinesus, eclipsed, by his personal merit, the birth and dignity of Theophilus, and formed a useful connection with the wealthy and charitable matron of Patras. Her spiritual, or carnal, love embraced the young adventurer, whom she adopted as her son. Danielis presented him with thirty slaves, and the produce of bounty was expanded in the support of his brothers, and the purchase of some large estates in Macedonia. His gratitude or ambition still attached him to the service of Theophilus, and a lucky accident recommended him to the notice of the court. A famous wrestler, in the train of the Bulgarian ambassadors, had defied, at the royal banquet, the boldest and most robust of the Greeks. The strength of Basil was praised. He accepted the challenge, and the barbarian champion was overthrown at the first onset. A beautiful but vicious horse was condemned to be hamstrung. It was subdued by the dexterity and courage of the servant of Theophilus, and his conqueror was promoted to an honourable rank in the imperial stables. But it was impossible to obtain the confidence of Michael without complying with his vices and his new favourite, the great chamberlain of the palace, was raised and supported by a disgraceful marriage with a royal concubine, and the dishonour of his sister, who succeeded to her place. The public administration had been abandoned to the Caesar Bardas, the brother and enemy of Theodora. But the arts of female influence persuaded Michael to hate and to fear his uncle. He was drawn from Constantinople, under the pretense of a Cretian expedition, and stabbed in the tent of audience by the sword of the chamberlain, and in the presence of the emperor. About a month after this execution, Basil was invested with the title of Augustus, and the government of the empire. He supported this unequal association, till his influence was fortified by popular esteem. His life was endangered by the caprice of the emperor, and his dignity was profaned by a second colleague, who had rowed in the galleys. Yet the murder of his benefactor must be condemned as an act of ingratitude and treason, and the churches which he dedicated to the name of St. Michael were a poor and puerile expiation of his guilt. The different ages of Basil I may be compared with those of Augustus. The situation of the Greek did not allow him in his earliest youth to lead an army against his country, or to prescribe the nobles of her sons. But his aspiring genius stooped to the arts of a slave. He dissembled his ambition, and even his virtues, 
and grasped, with the bloody hand of an assassin, the empire which he ruled with the wisdom and tenderness of a parent. A private citizen may feel his interest repugnant to his duty, but it must be from a deficiency of sense or courage that an absolute monarch can separate his happiness from his glory, or his glory from the public welfare. The life, or panegyric, of Basil has indeed been composed and published under the long reign of his descendants. But even their stability on the throne may be justly ascribed to the superior merit of their ancestor. In his character, his grandson Constantine has attempted to delineate a perfect image of royalty. But that feeble prince, unless he had copied a real model, could not easily have soared so high above the level of his own conduct or conceptions. But the most solid praise of Basil is drawn from the comparison of a ruined and flourishing monarchy, that which he wrestled from the dissolute Michael, and that which he bequeathed to the Macedonian dynasty. The evils which had been sanctified by time and example were corrected by his master hand, and he revived, if not the national spirit, at least the order and majesty of the Roman Empire. His application was indefatigable, his temper cool, his understanding vigorous and decisive, and in his practice he observed that rare and salutary moderation which pursues each virtue at an equal distance between the opposite vices. His military service had been confined to the palace, nor was the emperor endowed with the spirit or the talents of a warrior. Yet under his reign the Roman arms were again formidable to the barbarians. As soon as he had formed a new army by discipline and exercise, he appeared in person at the banks of the Euphrates, curbed the pride of the Saracens, and suppressed the dangerous, though just revolt, of the Manicheans. His indignation against a rebel, who had long eluded his pursuit, provoked him to wish and to pray, that, by the grace of God, he might drive three arrows into the head of Chrysocare. That odious head, which had been obtained by treason rather than by valour, was suspended from a tree, and thrice exposed to the dexterity of the imperial archer. A base revenge against the dead, more worthy of the times than of the character of Basil. But his principal merit was in the civil administration of the finances and of the laws. To replenish an exhausted treasury, it was proposed to resume the lavish and ill-placed gifts of his predecessor. His prudence abated one moiety of the restitution, and a sum of twelve hundred thousand pounds was instantly procured to answer the most pressing demands, and to allow some space for the mature options of economy. Among the various schemes for the improvement of the revenue, a new mode was suggested of capitation, or tribute, which would have too much depended on the arbitrary discretion of the assessors. A sufficient list of honest and able agents was instantly produced by the minister, but on the more careful scrutiny of Basil himself, only two could be found, who might be safely entrusted with such dangerous powers. But they justified his esteem by declining his confidence. But the serious and successful diligence of the emperor established by degrees the equitable balance of property and payment, of receipt and expenditure. A peculiar fund was appropriated to each service, and a public method secured the interest of the prince and the property of the people. After reforming the luxury, he assigned two patrimonial estates to supply the decent plenty of the imperial table. The contributions of the subject were revised for his defence, and the residue was employed in the establishment of the capital and provinces. A taste for building, however costly, may deserve some praise and much excuse. For thence industry is fed, art is encouraged, and some object is attained of public emolument or pleasure. The use of a road, an aqueduct, or a hospital is obvious and solid, and the hundred churches that arose by the command of Basil were consecrated to the devotion of the age. In the character of a judge he was assiduous and impartial, 
desirous to save, but not afraid to strike. The oppressors of the people were severely chastised, but his personal foes, whom it might be unsafe to pardon, were condemned, after the loss of their eyes, to a life of solitude and repentance. The change of language and manners demanded a revision of the obsolete jurisprudence of Justinian. The voluminous body of his institutes, pandects, code, and novels, was digested under forty titles in the Greek idiom. And the basilics, which were improved and completed by his son and grandson, must be referred to the original genius of the founder of their race. This glorious reign was terminated by an accident in the chase. A furious stag entangled his horns in the belt of Basil, and raised him from his horse. He was rescued by an attendant, who cut the belt and slew the animal. But the fall, or the fever, exhausted the strength of the aged monarch, and he expired in the palace amidst the tears of his family and people. If he struck off the head of the faithful servant for presuming to draw his sword against his sovereign, the pride of despotism, which had laid dormant in his life, revived in the last moments of despair, when he no longer wanted or valued the opinion of mankind. Of the four sons of the emperor, Constantine died before his father, whose grief and credulity were amused by a flattering impostor and a vain apparition. Stephen, the youngest, was content with the honours of a patriarch and a saint. Both Leo and Alexander were alike invested with the purple, but the powers of government were solely exercised by the elder brother. The name of Leo the Sixth has been dignified with the title of philosopher, and the union of the prince and the sage, of the active and speculative virtues, would indeed constitute the perfection of human nature but the claims of Leo are far short of this ideal excellence. Did he reduce his passions and appetites under the dominion of reason? His life was spent in the pomp of the palace, in the society of his wives and concubines, and even the clemency which he showed, and the peace which he strove to preserve, must be imputed to the softness and indolence of his character. Did he subdue his prejudices and those of his subjects? His mind was tinged with the most puerile superstition. The influence of the clergy and the errors of the people were consecrated by his laws. And the oracles of Leo, which reveal in prophetic style the fates of the empire, are founded on the art of astrology and divination. If we still inquire the reason of his sage appellation, it can only be replied— that the son of Basil was less ignorant than the greater part of his contemporaries in church and state. That his education had been directed by the learned Phiotius, and that several books of profane and ecclesiastical science were composed by the pen, or in the name, of the imperial philosopher. But the reputation of his philosophy and religion was overthrown by a domestic vice, the repetition of his nuptials, the primitive ideas of the merit and holiness of celibacy were preached by the monks and entertained by the Greeks. Marriage was allowed as a necessary means for the propagation of mankind. After the death of either party, the survivor might satisfy, by a second union, the weakness or the strength of the flesh. But a third marriage was censured as a state of legal fornication, and a fourth was a sin or scandal as yet unknown to the Christians of the East. In the beginning of his reign, Leo himself had abolished the state of concubines, and condemned, without annulling, third marriages. But his patriotism and love soon compelled him to violate his own laws, and to incur the penance, which in a similar case he had imposed on his subjects. In his three first alliances, his nuptial bed was unfruitful. The emperor acquired a female companion, and the empire a legitimate heir. The beautiful Zoe was introduced into the palace as a concubine, and, after a trial of her fecundity and the birth of Constantine, her lover declared his intention 
of legitimating the mother and the child, by the celebration of his fourth nuptials. But the patriarch Nicholas refused his blessing. The imperial baptism of the young prince was obtained by a promise of separation, and the contumacious husband of Zoe was excluded from the communion of the faithful. Neither the fear of exile, nor the desertion of his brethren, nor the authority of the Latin church, nor the danger of failure or doubt in the succession of the empire, could bend the spirit of the inflexible monk. After the death of Leo, he was recalled from exile to the civil and ecclesiastical administration, and the Edict of Union, which was promulgated in the name of Constantine, condemned the future scandal of fourth marriages, and left a tacit imputation on his own birth. In the Greek language, purple and porphyry are the same word, and as the colours of nature are invariable, we may learn that a dark deep red was the Tyrian dye which stained the purple of the ancients. An apartment of the Byzantine palace was lined with porphyry. It was reserved for use of the pregnant empress, and the royal birth of their children was expressed by the appellation of porphyrogenitae, or born in the purple. Several of the Roman princes had been blessed with an heir, but this peculiar surname was first applied to Constantine the Seventh. His life and titular reign were of equal duration. But of fifty-four years, six had elapsed before his father's death, and the son of Leo was ever the voluntary or reluctant subject of those who oppressed his weakness or abused his confidence. His uncle Alexander, who had long been invested with the title of Augustus, was the first colleague and governor of the young prince. But in a rapid career of vice and folly, the brother of Leo had emulated the reputation of Michael, and, when he was extinguished by a timely death, he entertained a project of castrating his nephew, and leaving the empire to a worthless favourite. The succeeding years of the minority of Constantine were occupied by his mother Zoe, and a succession or council of seven regents, who pursued their interest, gratified their passions, abandoned the republic, supplanted each other, and finally vanished in the presence of a soldier. From an obscure origin, Romanus Lacupenus had raised himself to the command of the naval armies, and in the anarchy of the times had deserved, or at least had obtained, the national esteem. With a victorious and affectionate fleet, he sailed from the mouth of the Danube into the harbour of Constantinople, and was hailed as the deliverer of the people, and the guardian of the prince. His supreme office was at first to find by the new appellation of father of the emperor. But Romanus soon disdained the subordinate powers of a minister, and assumed, with the titles of Caesar and Augustus, the full independence of royalty, which he held near five and twenty years. His three sons, Christopher, Stephen, and Constantine, were successively adorned with the same honours, and the lawful emperor was degraded from the first to the fifth rank in this college of princes. Yet in the preservation of his life and crown, he might still applaud his own fortune and clemency of the usurper. The examples of ancient and modern history would have excused the ambition of Romanus. The powers and the laws of the empire were in his hand. The spurious birth of Constantine would have justified his exclusion and the grave or the monastery was open to receive the son of the concubine. But Lecapenus did not appear to have possessed either the virtues or the vices of a tyrant. The spirit and activity of his private life dissolved away in the sunshine of the throne, and in his licentious pleasures he forgot the safety both of the republic and of his family. Of a mild and religious character, he respected the sanctity of oaths, the innocence of the youth, the memory of his parents, and the attachment of the people. The studious temper and retirement of Constantine disarmed the jealousy of power. His books and music, his pen and his pencil, 
were a constant source of amusement, and if he could improve a scanty allowance by the sale of his pictures, if their price was not enhanced by the name of the artist, he was endeavoured with a personal talent, which few princes could employ in the hour of adversity. The fall of Romanus was occasioned by his own vices and those of his children. After the decease of Christopher, his eldest son, the two surviving brothers quarrelled with each other, and conspired against their father. At the hour of noon, when all strangers were regularly excluded from the palace, they entered his apartment with an armed force, and conveyed him, in the habit of a monk, to a small island in the Propontis, which was peopled by a religious community. The rumour of this domestic revolution excited a tumult in the city. But Porfirio Genitus alone, the true and lawful emperor, was the object of the public care. And the sons of Lecopenus were taught, by tardy experience, that they had achieved a guilty and perilous enterprise for the benefit of their rival. Their sister Helena, the wife of Constantine, revealed or supposed their treacherous design of assassinating her husband at the royal banquet. His loyal adherents were alarmed, and the two usurpers were prevented, seized, degraded from the purple, and embarked for the same island and monastery where their father had been so lately confined. Old Romanus met them on the beach with a sarcastic smile, and, after a just reproach of their folly and ingratitude, presented his imperial colleagues with an equal share of his water and vegetable diet. In the fortieth year of his reign, Constantine the Seventh obtained the possession of the Eastern world, which he ruled, or seemed to rule, near fifteen years. But he was devoid of that energy of character which could emerge into a life of action and glory, and the studies, which had amused and dignified his leisure, were incompatible with the serious duties of a sovereign. The emperor neglected the practice to instruct his son Romanus in the theory of government, while he indulged the habits of intemperance and sloth, he dropped the reins of the administration into the hands of Helena, his wife, and, in the shifting scene of her favour and caprice, each minister was regretted in the promotion of a more worthless successor. Yet the birth and misfortunes of Constantine had endeared him to the Greeks. They excused his failings, they respected his learning, his innocence and charity, his love of justice, and the ceremony of his funeral was mourned with the unfeigned tears of his subjects. The body, according to ancient custom, lay in state in the vestibule of the palace, and the civil and military officers, the patricians, the senate, and the clergy, approached in due order to adore and kiss the inanimate corpse of their sovereign. Before the procession moved towards the imperial sepulchre, a herald proclaimed this awful admonition. Arise, O king of the world, and obey the summons of the king of kings. The death of Constantine was imputed to poison, and his son Romanus, who derived that name from his maternal grandfather, ascended the throne of Constantinople. A prince, who, at the age of twenty, could be suspected of anticipating his inheritance, must have been already lost in the public esteem. Yet Romanus was rather weak than wicked, and the largest share of his guilt was transferred to his wife, Theophano, a woman of base origin, masculine spirit, and flagacious manners. The sense of personal glory and public happiness, the true pleasure of royalty, were unknown to the son of Constantine. And while the two brothers Nicephorus and Leo triumphed over the Saracens, the hours which the emperor owed to his people were consumed in strenuous idleness. In the morning he visited the circus, at noon he feasted the senators, the greater part of the afternoon he spent in the Sphoreris Tyrium, or tennis court, the only theatre of his victories. From thence he passed over to the Asiatic side of the Bosphorus, hunted and killed four wild boars of the largest size, and returned to the palace proudly content with the labours of the day. In strength and beauty he was conspicuous above his equals, 
tall and straight as a young cypress. His complexion was fair and florid, his eyes sparkling, his shoulders broad, his nose long and aquiline. Yet even these perfections were insufficient to fix the love of Theophano, and, after a reign of four years, she mingled for her husband the same deadly drought which she had composed for his father. By his marriage with this impious woman, Romanus the younger left two sons, Basil the second and Constantine the ninth, and two daughters, Theophany and Anne. The eldest sister was given to Otho the second, emperor of the West. The younger became the wife of Wolodomir, great duke and apostle of Russia, and by the marriage of her granddaughter with Henry I, king of France, the blood of the Macedonians, and perhaps of the Arasakides, still flows in the veins of the Bourbon line. After the death of her husband, the empress aspired to reign in the name of her sons, the elder of whom was five, and the younger only two years of age. But she soon felt the instability of a throne, which was supported by a female who could not be esteemed, and two infants who could not be feared. Theophano looked round for a protector, and threw herself into the arms of the bravest soldier. Her heart was capacious, but the deformity of the new favourite rendered it more than probable that interest was the motive and excuse of her love. Nicophorus Phocus united, in the popular opinion, the double merit of a hero and a saint. In the former character his qualifications were genuine and splendid. The descendant of a race illustrious by their military exploits, he had displayed in every station and in every province the courage of a soldier and the conduct of a chief. And Nicephorus was crowned with recent laurels from the important conquest of the Isle of Crete. His religion was of a more ambiguous cast, and his hair cloth, his fasts, his pious idiom, and his wish to retire from the business of the world, were a convenient mask for his dark and dangerous ambition. Yet he imposed on a holy patriarch, by whose influence, and by a decree of the senate, he was entrusted, during the minority of the young princes, with the absolute and independent command of the oriental armies. And as soon as he had secured the leaders and the troops, he boldly marched to Constantinople, trampled on his enemies, avowed with correspondence with the empress, and, without degrading her sons, assumed, with the title of Augustus, the preeminence of rank and the plenitude of power. But his marriage with Theophany was refused by the same patriarch who had placed the crown on his head. By his second nuptials he incurred a year of canonical penance. A bar of spiritual affinity was opposed to their celebration, and some evasion and perjury were required to silence the scruples of the clergy and the people. The popularity of the emperor was lost in the purple. In a reign of six years he provoked the hatred of strangers and subjects, and the hypocrisy and avarice of the first Nicephorus were revived in his successor. Hypocrisy I shall never justify or palliate, but I will dare to observe, that the odious vice of avarice is of all others most hastily arraigned, and most unmercifully condemned. In a private citizen, our judgment seldom expects an accurate scrutiny into his fortune and expense. And in a steward of the public treasure, for guilty is always a virtue, and the increase of tax is too often an indispensable duty. In the use of his patrimony, the generous temper of Nicephorus had been proved, and the revenue was strictly applied to the service of the state. Each spring the emperor marched in person against the Saracens, and every Roman might compute the employment of his taxes in triumphs, conquests, and the security of the eastern barrier. End of chapter 48, part 3《Part Four of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Lizzie Driver. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Four, by Sir Edward Gibbon. Chapter Forty Eight, Succession and Character of the Greek Emperors, Part Four. Among the warriors who promoted his elevation and served under his standard, a noble and valiant Armenian had deserved and obtained the most eminent rewards. The stature of John Zimiscus was below the ordinary standard, but this diminutive body was endowed with strength, beauty, and the soul of a hero. By the jealousy of the emperor's brother, he was degraded from the office of general of the East to that of director of the posts and his murmurs were chastised with disgrace and exile. But Zimiscus was ranked among the numerous lovers of the empress. On her intercession he was permitted to reside at Chalcedon, in the neighbourhood of the capital. Her bounty was repaid in his clandestine and amorous visits to the palace, and Theophano consented, with alacrity, to the death of an ugly and penurious husband. Some bold and trusty conspirators were concealed in her most private chambers. In the darkness of a winter night, Zimiscus, with his principal companions, embarked in a small boat, traversed the Bosphorus, landed at the palace stairs, and silently ascended a ladder of ropes, which was cast down by the female attendants. Neither his own suspicions, nor the warnings of his friends, nor the tardy aid of his brother Leo, nor the fortress which he had erected in the palace, could prevent Nicephorus from a domestic foe, at whose voice every door was open to the assassin. As he slept on a bearskin on the ground, he was roused by their noisy intrusion, and thirty daggers glittered before his eyes. It is doubtful whether Zemiscus imbrued his hands in the blood of his sovereign, but he enjoyed the inhumane spectacle of revenge. The murder was protracted by insult and cruelty, and as soon as the head of Nicephorus was shown from the window, the tumult was hushed, and the Armenian was emperor of the East. On the day of his coronation he was stopped on the threshold of St. Sophia by the intrepid patriarch, who charged his conscience with the deed of treason and blood, and required, as a sign of repentance, that he should separate himself from his more criminal associate. This sally of apostolic zeal was not offensive to the prince, since he could neither love nor trust a woman who had repeatedly violated the most sacred obligations. And Theophano, instead of sharing his imperial fortune, was dismissed with ignominy from his bed and palace. In their last interview she displayed a frantic and impotent rage, accused the ingratitude of her lover, assaulted with words and blows her son Basil, as he stood silent and submissive in the presence of a superior colleague, and avowed her own prostitution in proclaiming the illegitimacy of his birth. The public indignation was appeased by her exile and the punishment of the meaner accomplices. The death of an unpopular prince was forgiven, and the guilt of Zemiscus was forgotten in the splendour of his virtues. Perhaps his profusion was less useful to the state than the avarice of Nicephorus, but his gentle and generous behaviour delighted all who approached his person, and it was only in the paths of victory that he trod in the footsteps of his predecessor. The greatest part of his reign was employed in the camp and the field. His personal valour and activity were signalised on the Danube and the Tigris, the ancient boundaries of the Roman world. And by his double triumph over the Russians and the Saracens, he deserved the titles of saviour of the empire and conqueror of the east. In his last return from Syria, he observed that the most fruitful lands of his new provinces were possessed by the eunuchs. "'And is it for them,' he exclaimed with honest indignation, "'that we have fought and conquered? "'Is it for them that we shed our blood "'and exhaust the treasures of our people?' "'The complaint was re-echoed to the palace, "'and the death of Zemiscus is strongly marked "'with the suspicion of poison. 
under this usurpation or regency of twelve years the two lawful emperors basil and constantine had silently grown to the age of manhood their tender years had been incapable of dominion the respectful modesty of their attendance and salutation was due to the age and merit of their guardians the childless ambitions of those guardians had no temptation to violate the right of succession their patrimony was ably and faithfully administered and the premature death of zimiscus was a loss rather than a benefit to the sons of romanus their want of experience detained them twelve years longer the obscure and voluntary pupils of a minister who extended his reign by persuading them to indulge the pleasures of youth and to disdain the labours of government in this silken web the weakness of constantine was for ever entangled but his elder brother felt the impulse of genius and the desire of action he frowned and the minister was no more basil was the acknowledged sovereign of constantinople and the provinces of europe but asia was oppressed by two veteran generals phocus and sclerus who alternately friends and enemies subjects and rebels maintained their independence, and laboured to emulate the example of successful usurpation. Against these domestic enemies, the son of Romanus first drew his sword, and they trembled in the presence of a lawful and high-spirited prince. The first, in the front of battle, was thrown from his horse, by the stroke of poison or an arrow. The second, who had been twice loaded with chains, and twice invested with the purple, was desirous of ending in peace the small remainder of his days. As the aged suppliant approached the throne, with dim eyes and faltering steps, leaning on his two attendants, the emperor exclaimed, in the insolence of youth and power, And is this the man who has been so long the object of our terror? After he had confirmed his own authority, and the peace of the empire, the trophies of Nicephorus and Zimiscus would not suffer their royal pupil to sleep in the palace. His long and frequent expeditions against the Saracens were rather glorious than useful to the empire. But the final destruction of the kingdom of Bulgaria appears, since the time of Belisarius, the most important triumph of the Roman arms. Yet, instead of applauding their victorious prince, his subjects detested the rapacious and rigid avarice of Basil, and in the imperfect narrative of his exploits, we can only discern the courage, patience, and ferociousness of a soldier. A vicious education, which could not subdue his spirit, had clouded his mind. He was ignorant of every science, and the remembrance of his learned and feeble grandsire might encourage his real or affected contempt of laws and lawyers, of artists and arts. Of such a character in such an age, superstition took a firm and lasting possession. After the first license of his youth, Basil the Second devoted his life, in the palace and the camp, to the penance of a hermit, while the monistic habit under his robes and armour observed a vow of countenance and imposed on his appetite a perpetual abstinence from wine and flesh. In the sixty-eighth year of his age, his martial spirit urged him to embark in person for a holy war against the Saracens of Sicily. He was prevented by death, and Basil, surnamed the Slayer of the Bulgarians, was dismissed from the world with the blessings of the clergy and the curse of the people. After his decease, his brother Constantine enjoyed, about three years, the power, or rather the pleasures, of royalty, and his only care was the settlement of the succession. He had enjoyed sixty-six years the title of Augustus, and the reign of the two brothers is the longest and most obscure of the Byzantine history. The lineal succession of five emperors, in a period of one hundred and sixty years, had attached the loyalty of the Greeks to the Macedonian dynasty, which had been thrice respected by the usurpers of their power. 
after the death of Constantine the Ninth, the last male of the royal race, a new and broken scene presents itself, and the accumulated years of twelve emperors do not equal the space of his single reign. His elder brother had preferred his private chastity to the public interest, and Constantine himself had only three daughters, Eudocia, who took the veil, and Zoe and Theodora, who were preserved till a mature age in a state of ignorance and virginity. When their marriage was discussed in the council of their dying father, the cold or pious Theodora refused to give an heir to the empire. But her sister Zoe presented herself a willing victim at the altar. Romanus Argyrus, a patrician of a graceful person and fair reputation, was chosen for her husband, and, on his declining that honour, was informed that blindness or death was the second alternative. The motive of his reluctance was conjugal affection, but his faithful wife sacrificed her own happiness to his safety and greatness, and her entrance into a monastery removed the only bar to the imperial nuptials. After the decease of Constantine, the sceptre devolved to Romanus the Third, but his labours at home and abroad were equally feeble and fruitless. And the mature age, the forty-eight years of Zoe, were less favourable to the hopes of pregnancy than to the indulgence of pleasure. Her favourite chamberlain was a handsome pathologian of the name of Michael, whose first trade had been that of a money-changer, and Romanus, either from gratitude or equity, connived at their criminal intercourse, or accepted a slight assurance of their innocence. But Zoe soon justified the Roman maxim, that every adulteress is capable of poisoning her husband, and the death of Romanus was instantly followed by the scandalous marriage and elevation of Michael the Fourth. The expectations of Zoe were, however, disappointed. Instead of a vigorous and grateful lover, she had placed in her bed a miserable wretch, whose health and reason were impaired by epileptic fits, and whose conscience was tormented by despair and remorse. The most skilful physicians of the mind and body were summoned to his aid, and his hopes were amused by frequent pilgrimages to the baths, and to the tombs of the most popular saints. The monks applauded his penance, and, except restitution, but to whom should he have restored, Michael sought every method of expiating his guilt. While he groaned and prayed in sackcloth and ashes, his brother, the eunuch John, smiled at his remorse, and enjoyed the harvest of a crime of which himself was the secret and most guilty author. His administration was the only art of satiating his avarice, and so he became a captive in the palace of her father's, and in the hands of her slaves. When he perceived the irretrievable decline of his brother's health, he introduced his nephew, another Michael, who derived his surname of Caliphates, from his father's occupation in the careening of vessels. At the command of the eunuch, Zoe adopted for her son the son of a mechanic, and this fictitious heir was invested with the title and purple of the Caesars, in the presence of the senate and clergy. So feeble was the character of Zoe, that she was oppressed by the liberty and power which she recovered by the death of the Paphlagonian, and at the end of four days she placed the crown on the head of Michael V, who had protested, with tears and oaths, that he should ever reign the first and most obedient of her subjects. The only act of his short reign was his base ingratitude to his benefactors, the eunuch and the empress. The disgrace of the former was pleasing to the public, but the murmurs, and at length the clamours, of Constantinople deplored the exile of Zoe, the daughter of so many emperors. Her vices were forgotten, and Michael was taught that there is a period in which the patience of the tamest slaves rises into fury and revenge. The citizens of every degree assembled in a formidable tumult 
which lasted three days. They besieged the palace, forced the gates, recalled their mothers, Zoe from her prison, Theodora from a monastery, and condemned the son of Caliphatus to the loss of his eyes or his life. For the first time the Greeks beheld with surprise the two royal sisters seated on the same throne, presiding in the senate, and giving audience to the ambassadors of the nations. But the singular union subsisted no more than two months. The two sovereigns, their tempers, interests, and adherents, were secretly hostile to each other. And as Theodora was still averse to marriage, the indefatigable Zoe, at the age of sixty, consented, for the public good, to sustain the embraces of a third husband and the censures of the Greek church. His name and number were Constantine the Tenth, and the epithet of Monomachus, the single combatant, must have been expressive of his valour and victory in some public or private quarrel. But his health was broken by the tortures of the gout, and his dissolute reign was spent in the alternative of sickness and pleasure. A fair and noble widow had accompanied Constantine in his exile to the Isle of Lesbos, and Sclerina gloried in the appellation of his mistress. After his marriage and elevation, she was invested with the title and pomp of Augusta, and occupied a contiguous apartment in the palace. The lawful consort, such was the delicacy or corruption of Zoe, consented to this strange and scandalous partition, and the emperor appeared in public between his wife and his concubine. He survived them both, but the last measures of Constantine to change the order of succession were prevented by the more vigilant friends of Theodora, and after his decease she resumed, with the general consent, the possession of her inheritance. In her name, and by the influence of four eunuchs, the eastern world was peaceably governed about nineteen months. And as they wished to prolong their dominion, they persuaded the aged princess to nominate for her successor Michael the Sixth. The surname of Stratioticus declares his military profession. But the crazy and decrepit veteran could only see with the eyes and execute with the hands of his ministers. Whilst he ascended the throne, Theodora sunk into the grave, the last of the Macedonian or Basilian dynasty. I have hastily reviewed, and gladly dismiss, this shameful and destructive period of twenty-eight years, in which the Greeks, degraded below the common level of servitude, were transferred like a herd of cattle by the choice or caprice of two impotent females. From this night of slavery, a ray of freedom, or at least of spirit, begins to emerge. The Greeks either preserved or revived the use of surnames, which perpetrate the fame of hereditary virtue, and we now discern the rise, succession, and alliances of the last dynasties of Constantinople and Trebizond. The Komnenai, who upheld for a while the fate of the sinking empire, assumed the honour of a Roman origin. But the family had been long since transported from Italy to Asia. Their patrimonial estate was situated in the district of Castamona, in the neighbourhood of the Euxin. And one of their chiefs, who had already entered the paths of ambition, revisited with affection, perhaps with regret, the modest though honourable dwellings of his father's, the first of their line was the illustrious Manuel, who, in the reign of the second Basil, contributed by war and treaty to appease the troubles of the East. He left, in a tender age, two sons, Isaac and John, whom, with the consciousness of desert, he bequeathed to the gratitude and favour of his sovereign. The noble youths were carefully trained in the learning of the monastery, the arts of the palace, and the exercises of the camp, and from the domestic service of the guards they were rapidly promoted to the command of provinces and armies. 
their fraternal union doubled the force and reputation of the Komnenni, and their ancient nobility was illustrated by the marriage of the two brothers, with the captive princes of Bulgaria, and the daughter of a patrician, who had obtained the name of Charon, from the number of enemies whom he had sent to the infernal shades. The soldiers had served with reluctant loyalty a series of effeminate masters. The elevation of Michael the Sixth was a personal insult to the more deserving generals, and their discontent was inflamed by the parsimony of the emperor and the insolence of the eunuchs. They secretly assembled in the sanctuary of St. Sophia, and the votes of the military synod would have been unanimous in favour of the old and valiant Catacaulon. If the patriotism or modesty of the veteran had not suggested the importance of birth, as well as merit in the choice of a sovereign. Isaac Comnenus was approved by general consent, and the associates separated without delay to meet in the plains of Phrygia, at the head of their respective squadrons and detachments. The cause of Michael was defended in a single battle by the mercenaries of the imperial guard, who were aliens to the public interest, and animated only by a principle of honour and gratitude. After their defeat, the fears of the emperor solicited a treaty, which was almost accepted by the moderation of the Comnenian. But the former was betrayed by his ambassadors, and the latter was prevented by his friends. The solitary Michael submitted to the voice of the people, the patriarch annulled their oath of allegiance, and as he shaved the head of the royal monk, congratulated his beneficial exchange of temporal royalty for the kingdom of heaven. An exchange, however, which the priest, on his own account, would probably have declined. By the hands of the same patriarch, Isaac Comnenus was solemnly crowned. The sword which he inscribed on his coins might have been an offensive symbol, if it implied his title by conquests. But this sword would have been drawn against the foreign and domestic enemies of the state. The decline of his health and vigour suspended the operation of active virtue, and the prospect of approaching death determined him to interpose some moments between life and eternity. But instead of leaving the empire as the married portion of his daughter, his reason and inclination concurred in the preference of his brother John, a soldier, a patriot, and the father of five sons, the future pillars of an hereditary succession. His first modest reluctance might be the natural dictates of discretion and tenderness, but his obstinate and successful perseverance, however it may dazzle with the show of virtue, must be censured as a criminal desertion of his duty, and a rare offence against his family and country. The purple which he had refused was accepted by Constantine Ducas, a friend of the Comnenian house, and whose noble birth was adorned with the experience and reputation of civil policy. In the monistic habit, Isaac recovered his health, and survived two years his voluntary abdication. At the command of his abbot, he observed the rule of St. Basil, and executed the most servile offices of the convent. But his latent vanity was gratified by the frequent and respectful visits of the reigning monarch, who revered in his person the character of a benefactor and a saint. If Constantine the Eleventh was indeed the subject most worthy of an empire, we must pity the debasement of the age and nation in which he was chosen. In the labour of puerile declamations he sought, without obtaining, the crown of eloquence, more precious in his opinion than that of Rome. And in the subordinate functions of a judge, he forgot the duties of a sovereign and a warrior. Far from imitating the patriotic indifference of the authors of his greatness, Ducasse was anxious only to secure, at the expense of the Republic, the power and prosperity of his children. His three sons, Michael the Seventh, Andronicus the First, and Constantine the Twelfth, were invested, in a tender age, with the equal title of Augustus. 
and the succession was speedily opened by their father's death. His widow Eudocia was entrusted with the administration, but experience had taught the jealousy of the dying monarch to protect his sons from the danger of her second nuptials, and her solemn engagement, attested by the principal senators, was deposited in the hands of the patriarch. Before the end of seven months, the wants of Eudocia, or those of the state, called aloud for the male virtues of a soldier, and her heart had already chosen Romanus, Diogenes, whom she raised from the scaffold to the throne. The discovery of a treasonable attempt had exposed him to the severity of the laws. His beauty and valour dissolved him in the eyes of the empress, and Romanus, from a mild exile, was recalled on the second day to the command of the oriental armies. Her royal choice was yet unknown to the public, and the promise which she would have betrayed her falsehood and levity was stolen by a dexterous emissary from the ambition of the patriarch. Cyphelion, at first alleged the sanctity of oaths and the sacred nature of a trust, but a whisper that his brother was the future emperor relaxed his scruples, and forced him to confess that the public safety was the supreme law. He resigned the important paper, and when his hopes were confounded by the nomination of Romanus, he could no longer regain his security, retract his declarations, nor oppose the second nuptials of the empress. Yet a murmur was heard in the palace, and the barbarian guards had raised their battle-axes in the cause of the house of Lucas, till the young princes were soothed by the tears of their mother, and the solemn assurances of the fidelity of their guardian, who filled the imperial station with dignity and honour. Hereafter I shall relate his valiant, but unsuccessful, efforts to resist the progress of the Turks. His defeat and captivity inflicted a deadly wound on the Byzantine monarchy of the East, and after he was released from the chains of the sultan, he vainly sought his wife and his subjects. His wife had been thrust into a monastery, and the subjects of Romanus had embraced the rigid maxim of the civil law, that a prisoner in the hands of the enemy is deprived, as by the stroke of death, of all the public and private rights of a citizen. In the general consternation, the Caesar John asserted the indefeasible right of his three nephews. Constantinople listened to his voice, and the Turkish captive was proclaimed in the capital, and received on the frontier as an enemy of the Republic. Romanus was not more fortunate in domestic than in foreign war. The loss of two battles compelled him to yield, on the assurance of fair and honourable treatment, but his enemies were devoid of faith or humanity and, after the cruel extinction of his sight, his wounds were left to bleed and corrupt, till in a few days he was relieved from a state of misery. Under the triple reign of the house of Ducas, the two younger brothers were reduced to the vain honours of the purple. But the eldest, the pusillanimous Michael, was incapable of sustaining the Roman sceptre, and his surname of Parapinicus denotes the reproach which he shared with an avaricious favourite, who enhanced the price and diminished the measure of wheat. In the school of Zealous, and after the example of his mother, the son of Eudocia made some proficiency in philosophy and rhetoric, but his character was degraded rather than ennobled by the virtues of a monk and the learning of a sophist. Strong in the contempt of their sovereign and their own esteem, Two generals, at the head of the European and Asiatic legions, assumed the purple at Adrianople and Nice. Their revolt was in the same months. They bore the same name of Nicephorus, but the two candidates were distinguished by the surnames of Bryennius and Botaniatus, the former in the maturity of wisdom and courage, the latter conspicuous only by the memory of his past exploits. While Botaniatus advanced with cautious and dilatory steps, his active competitors stood in arms before the gates of Constantinople. 
The name of Bryennius was illustrious, his cause was popular, but his licentious troops could not be restrained from burning and pillaging a suburb, and the people, who would have hailed the rebel, rejected and repulsed the incendiary of his country. This change of the public opinion was favourable to Botaniatus, who, at length, with an army of Turks, approached the shores of Chalcedon. A formal invitation, in the name of the Patriarch, the Sinoid, and the Senate, was circulated through the streets of Constantinople, and the General Assembly, in the dome of St. Sophia, debated, with order and calmness, on the choice of their sovereign. The guards of Michael would have dispersed this unarmed multitude, but the feeble emperor, applauding his own moderation and clemency, resigned the ensigns of royalty, and was rewarded with the monistic habit, and the title of Archbishop of Ephesus. He left a son, a Constantine, born and educated in the purple, and a daughter of the house of Ducas, illustrated the blood, and confirmed the succession of the Comnenian dynasty. John Comnenius, the brother of the Emperor Isaac, survived in peace and dignity his generous refusal of the scepter. By his wife Anne, a woman of masculine spirit and a policy, he left eight children. The three daughters multiplied the Comnenian alliance with the noblest of the Greeks. Of the five sons, Manuel was stopped by a premature death, Isaac and Alexis restored the imperial greatness of their house, which was enjoyed without toil or danger by the two younger brethren, Adrian and Nicephorus. Alexis, the third and most illustrious of the brothers, was endowed by nature with the choicest gifts of mind and body. They were cultivated by a liberal education, and exercised in the school of obedience and adversity. The youth was dismissed from the perils of the Turkish war by the paternal care of the Emperor Romanus. But the mother of the Komnenni, with her aspiring face, was accused of treason and banished by the sons of Ducas to an island in the Propontis. The two brothers soon emerged into favour and action, fought by each other's side against the rebels and barbarians, and adhered to the Emperor Michael till he was deserted by the world and by himself. In his first interview with Botaniatus, Prince, said Alexis with a noble frankness, my duty rendered me your enemy. The decrees of God and of the people have made me your subject. Judge of my future loyalty by my past opposition. The successor of Michael entertained him with esteem and confidence. His valour was employed against three rebels, who disturbed the peace of the empire, or at least of the emperors. Ursel, Brennius, and Basilatius were formidable by their numerous forces and military fame. They were successfully vanquished in the field, and led in chains to the foot of the throne, and whatever treatment they might receive from a timid and cruel court, they applauded the clemency, as well as the courage, of their conqueror. But the loyalty of the Comemni was soon tainted by fear and suspicion. Nor is it easy to settle between a subject and a despot. The debt of gratitude, which the former is tempted to claim by a revolt, and the latter to discharge by an executioner. The refusal of Alexis to march against a fourth rebel, the husband of his sister, destroyed the merit or memory of his past services. The favourites of Botaniatus provoked the ambition which they apprehended and accused, and the retreat of the two brothers might be justified by the defence of their life and liberty. The women of the family were deposited in a sanctuary, respected by tyrants. The men, mounted on horseback, sallied from the city, and erected the standard of civil war. The soldiers, who had been gradually assembled in the capital and the neighbourhood, were devoted to the cause of a victorious and injured leader. The ties of common interest and domestic alliance secured the attachment of the house of Ducas, 
and the generous dispute of the Comenni was terminated by the decisive resolution of Isaac, who was the first to invest his younger brother with the name and ensigns of royalty. They returned to Constantinople, to threaten rather than besiege the impregnable fortress. But the fidelity of the guards was corrupted, a gate was surprised, and the fleet was occupied by the active courage of George Palais Logus, who fought against his father, without foreseeing that he laboured for his posterity. Alexis ascended the throne, and his aged competitor disappeared in a monastery. An army of various nations was gratified with the pillage of the city, but the public disorders were expiated by the tears and farce of the Comemni, who submitted to every penance compatible with the possession of the empire. The life of the emperor Alexis has been delineated by a favourite daughter, who was inspired by a tender regard for his person, and a laudable zeal to perpetuate his virtues. Conscious of the just suspicions of her readers, the princess Anna Comnena repeatedly protests that, besides her personal knowledge, she had searched the discourses and writings of the most respected veterans, and, after an interval of thirty years, forgotten by and forgetful of the world, her mournful solitude was inaccessible to hope and fear, and that truth, the naked perfect truth, was more dear and sacred than the memory of her parent. Yet, instead of the simplicity of style and narrative which wins our belief, an elaborate affectation of rhetoric and science betrays in every page the vanity of a female author. The genuine character of Alexis is lost in a vague constellation of virtues, and the perpetual strain of panegyric and apology awakens our jealousy to question the veracity of the historian and the merit of the hero. We cannot, however, refuse her judicious and important remark that the discords of the time were the misfortune and the glory of Alexis, and that every calamity which can afflict a declining empire was accumulated on his reign by the justice of heaven and the vices of his predecessors. In the east, the victorious Turks had spread, from Persia to the Hellespont, the reign of the Korean and the Crescent. The west was invaded by the adventurous valour of the Normans, and, in the moments of peace, the Danube poured forth new swarms, who had gained, in the science of war, what they had lost in the ferociousness of manners. The sea was not less hostile than the land, and while the frontiers were assaulted by an open enemy, the palace was distracted with secret treason and conspiracy. On a sudden, the banner of the cross was displayed by the Latins. Europe was precipitated on Asia, and Constantinople had almost been swept away by this impetuous deluge. In the tempest, Alexis steered the imperial vessel with dexterity and courage. At the head of his armies he was bold in action, skilful in stratagem, patient of fatigue, ready to improve his advantages, and rising from his defeats with inexhaustible vigour. The discipline of the camp was revived, and a new generation of men and soldiers was created by the example and precepts of their leader. In his intercourse with the Latins, Alexis was patient and artful. His discerning eye pervaded the new system of an unknown world, and I shall hereafter describe the superior policy with which he balanced the interests and passions of the champions of the First Crusade. In a long reign of thirty-seven years, he subdued and pardoned the envy of his equals, the laws of public and private order were restored, the arts of wealth and science were cultivated, the limits of the empire were enlarged in Europe and Asia, and the Comnenian scepter was transmitted to his children of the third and fourth generation. Yet the difficulties of the times betrayed some defects in his character, and have exposed his memory to some just or ungenerous reproach. The reader may possibly smile at the lavish praise which his daughter so often bestows on a flying hero. The weakness or prudence of his situation might be mistaken for a want of personal courage. 
and his political arts are branded by the Latins with the names of deceit and dissimulation. The increase of the male and female branches of his family adorned the throne and secured the succession, but their princely luxury and pride offended the patricians, exhausted the revenue, and insulted the misery of the people. Anna is a faithful witness that his happiness was destroyed and his health was broken by the cares of a public life. The patience of Constantinople was fatigued by the length and severity of his reign, and before Alexis expired he had lost the love and reverence of his subjects. The clergy could not forgive his application of the sacred riches to the defence of the state, but they applauded his theological learning and ardent zeal for the orthodox faith, which he defended with his tongue, his pen, and his sword. His character was degraded by the superstition of the Greeks, and the same inconstant principle of human nature enjoined the emperor to found a hospital for the poor and infirm, and to direct the execution of a heretic who was burned alive in the square of St. Sophia. Even the sincerity of his moral and religious virtues was suspected by the persons who had passed their lives in his familiar confidence. In his last hours, when he was pressed by his wife Irene to alter the succession, he raised his head and breathed a pious ejaculation on the vanity of this world. The indignant reply of the empress may be inscribed as an epithet on his tomb. You die as you have lived, a hypocrite. It was the wish of Irene to supplant the eldest of her surviving sons in favour of her daughter, the Princess Anne, whose philosophy would not have refused the weight of a diadem. But the order of male succession was asserted by the friends of their country. The lawful heir drew the royal signet from the finger of his insensible or conscious father, and the empire obeyed the master of the palace. Anna Comnena was stimulated by ambition and revenge to conspire against the life of her brother, and when the design was prevented by the fears or scruples of her husband, she passionately exclaimed that nature had mistaken the two sexes, and had endowed Bryennius with the soul of a woman. The two sons of Alexis, John and Isaac, maintained their fraternal concord, the hereditary virtue of their race and the younger brother was content with the title of Sebastocrator, which approached the dignity, without sharing the power, of the emperor. In the same person, the claims of primogeniture and merit were fortunately united. His swarthy complexion, harsh features, and diminutive stature had suggested the ironical surname of Callo Johannes, or John the Handsome, which his grateful subjects more seriously applied to the beauties of his mind. After the discovery of her treason, the life and fortune of Anne were justly fortified to the laws. Her life was spared by the clemency of the emperor, but he visited the pomp and treasures of her palace, and bestowed the rich confiscation on the most deserving of his friends. That respectable friend, Axic, a slave of Turkish extraction, presumed to decline the gift and to intercede for the criminal. His generous master applauded and imitated the virtue of his favourite, and the reproach or complaint of an injured brother was the only chastisement of the guilty princess. After this example of clemency, the remainder of his reign was never disturbed by conspiracy or rebellion. Feared by his nobles, beloved by his people, John was never reduced to the painful necessity of punishing, or even of pardoning, his personal enemies. During his government of twenty-five years, the penalty of death was abolished in the Roman Empire, a law of mercy most delightful to the human theorist, but of which the practice, in a large and vicious community, is seldom consistent with the public safety. Severe to himself, indulgent to others, chaste, frugal, abstemious, the philosophic Marcus would not have disdained the artless virtues of his successor, derived from his heart, 
and not borrowed from the schools he despised and moderated the stately magnificence of the byzantine court so oppressive to the people so contemptible to the eye of reason under such a prince innocence had nothing to fear and merit had everything to hope and without assuming the tyrannic office of a censor he introduced a gradual though visible reformation in the public and private manners of constantinople the only defect of this accomplished character was the frailty of noble minds the love of arms and military glory yet the frequent expeditions of john the handsome may be justified at least in their principle by the necessity of repelling the turks from the hellespont and the bosphorus the sultan of iconium was confined to his capital the barbarians were driven to the mountains and the maritime provinces of asia enjoyed the transient blessings of their deliverance from constantinople to antioch and aleppo he repeatedly marched at the head of a victorious army and in the sieges and battles of this holy war his latin allies were astonished by the superior spirit and prowess of a greek as he began to indulge the ambitious hope of restoring the ancient limits of the empire as he revolved in his mind the euphrates and tigris the dominion of syria and the conquest of jerusalem the thread of his life and of the public felicity was broken by a singular accident he hunted the wild boar in the valley of anazarbus and had fixed his javelin in the body of the furious animal but in the struggle a poisoned arrow dropped from his quiver and a slight wound in his hand which produced a mortification was fatal to the best and greatest of the Comnenian princes. End of chapter 48, part 4《Of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Chapter 48. Succession and Characters of the Greek Emperors. Part 5. A premature death had swept away the two eldest sons of John the Handsome. Of the two survivors, Isaac and Manuel, his judgment or affection preferred the younger, and the choice of their dying prince was ratified by the soldiers, who had applauded the valour of his favourite in the Turkish war. The faithful Axak hastened to the capital, secured the person of Isaac in honourable confinement, and purchased, with a gift of two hundred pounds of silver, the leading ecclesiastics of St. Sophia who possessed a decisive voice in the consecration of an emperor. With his veteran and affectionate troops, Manuel soon visited Constantinople. His brother acquiesced in the title of Sebastor Creator. His subjects admired the lofty stature and martial graces of their new sovereign, and listened with credulity to the flattering promise that he blended the wisdom of age with the activity and vigour of youth. By the experience of his government they were taught that he emulated the spirit and shared the talents of his father whose social virtues were buried in the grave. A reign of thirty-seven years is filled by a perpetual though various warfare against the Turks, the Christians and the hordes of the wilderness beyond the Danube. The arms of Manuel were exercised on Mount Taurus in the plains of Hungary on the coast of Italy and Egypt, and on the seas of Sicily and Greece. The influence of his negotiations extended from Jerusalem to Rome and Russia, and the Byzantine monarchy, for a while, became an object of respect or terror to the powers of Asia and Europe. Educated in the silk and purple of the East, Manuel possessed the iron temper of a soldier, which cannot easily be paralleled, except in the lives of Richard I of England, and of Charles XII of Sweden. Such was his strength and exercise in arms, 
that Raymond, surnamed the Hercules of Antioch, was incapable of wielding the lance and buckler of the Greek emperor. In a famous tournament, he entered the lists on a fiery courser, and overturned in his first career two of the stoutest of the Italian knights. The first in the charge, the last in the retreat. His friends and his enemies alike trembled, the former for his safety, and the latter for their own. After posting an ambuscade in a wood, he rode forward in search of some perilous adventure, accompanied only by his brother and the faithful Axuk, who refused to desert their sovereign. Eighteen horsemen, after a short combat, fled before them, but the numbers of the enemy increased, the march of the reinforcement was tardy and fearful, and Manuel, without receiving a wound, cut his way through a squadron of five hundred Turks. In a battle against the Hungarians, impatient of the slowness of his troops, he snatched a standard from the head of the column, and was the first, almost alone, who passed a bridge that separated him from the enemy. In the same country, after transporting his army beyond the save, he sent back the boats, with an order under pain of death to their commander, that he should leave them to conquer or die in that hostile land. In the siege of Corfu, towing after him a captive galley, the emperor stood aloft on the poop, opposing against the volleys of darts and stones, a large buckler and a flowing sail. Nor could he have escaped inevitable death, had not the Sicilian admiral enjoined his archers to respect the person of a hero. In one day he is said to have slain above forty of the barbarians with his own hand. He returned to the camp, dragging along four Turkish prisoners, whom he had tied to the rings of his saddle. He was ever the foremost to provoke or to accept a single combat, and the gigantic champions who encountered his arm were transpeared by the lance, or cut asunder by the sword of the invincible Manuel. The story of his exploits, which appear as a model or a copy of the romances of chivalry, may induce a reasonable suspicion of the veracity of the Greeks. I will not, to vindicate their credit, endanger my own. Yet I may observe that, in the long series of their annals, Manuel is the only prince who has been the subject of similar exaggeration. With the valour of a soldier, he did not unite the skill or prudence of a general. His victories were not productive of any permanent or useful conquest, and his Turkish laurels were blasted in his last unfortunate campaign, in which he lost his army in the mountains of Pisidia, and owed his deliverance to the generosity of the sultan. But the most singular feature in the character of Manuel is the contrast and vicissitude of labour and sloth, of hardiness and effeminacy. In war he seemed ignorant of peace, in peace he appeared incapable of war. In the field he slept in the sun or in the snow, tired in the longest marches the strength of his men and horses, and shared with a smile the abstinence or diet of the camp. No sooner did he return to Constantinople than he resigned himself to the arts and pleasures of a life of luxury. The expense of his dress, his table, and his palace surpassed the measure of his predecessors and whole summer days were idly wasted in the delicious isles of the Propontis, in the incestuous love of his niece Theodora. The double cost of a warlike and dissolute prince exhausted the revenue and multiplied the taxes, and Manuel, in the distress of his last Turkish campaign, endured a bitter reproach from the mouth of a desperate soldier. As he quenched his thirst, he complained that the water of a fountain was mingled with Christian blood. "'It is not the first time,' exclaimed a voice from the crowd, "'that you have drunk, O Emperor, the blood of your Christian subjects.' Manuel Comnenus was twice married, to the virtuous Bertha, or Irene of Germany, and to the beauteous Maria, a French or Latin princess of Antioch. The only daughter of his first wife, was destined for Bella, a Hungarian prince, who was educated at Constantinople under the name of Alexis. And the consummation of their nuptials might have transferred the Roman sceptre to a race of free and warlike barbarians. 
but as soon as Maria of Antioch had given a son and heir to the empire, the presumptive rights of Bella were abolished, and he was deprived of his promised bride. But the Hungarian prince resumed his name and the kingdom of his fathers, and displayed such virtues as might excite the regret and envy of the Greeks. The son of Maria was named Alexis, and at the age of ten years he ascended the Byzantine throne, after his father's decease had closed the glories of the Comemnian line. The fraternal concord of the two sons of the great Alexis had been sometimes clouded by an opposition of interest and passion. By ambition, Isaac, the Sebasto creator, was excited to flight and rebellion, from whence he was reclaimed by the firmness and clemency of John the Handsome. The errors of Isaac, the father of the emperors of Trebizond, were short and venial. But John, the elder of his sons, renounced for ever his religion. Provoked by a real or imaginary insult of his uncle, he escaped from the Roman to the Turkish camp. His apostate was rewarded with the sultan's daughter, the title of Chelebi, or noble, and the inheritance of a princely estate. And in the fifteenth century, Mohammed the second boasted of his imperial descent from the Comenian family. Andronicus, the younger brother of John, son of Isaac, and grandson of Alexius Comnenus, is one of the most conspicuous characters of the age, and his genuine adventures might form the subject of a very singular romance. To justify the choice of three ladies of royal birth, it is incumbent on me to observe that their fortunate lover was cast in the best proportions of strength and beauty, and that the want of the softer graces was supplied by a manly countenance, a lofty stature, athletic muscles, and the air and deportment of a soldier. The preservation in his old age of health and vigour was the reward of temperance and exercise. A piece of bread and a draught of water was often his sole and evening repast, and if he tasted of a wild boar or a stag, which he had roasted with his own hands, it was the well-earned fruits of a laborious chase. Dexterous in arms, he was ignorant of fear, his persuasive eloquence could bend to every situation and character of life. His style, though not his practice, was fashioned by the example of St. Paul. And, in every deed of mischief, he had a heart to resolve, a head to contrive, and a hand to execute. In his youth, after the death of the Emperor John, he followed the retreat of the Roman army. But, in the march through Asia Minor, Design or accident tempted him to wander in the mountains. The hunter was encompassed by the Turkish huntsmen, and he remained some time a reluctant or willing captive in the power of the sultan. His virtues and vices recommended him to the favour of his cousin. He shared the perils and the pleasures of Manuel, and while the emperor lived in public incest with his niece Theodora, the affections of her sister Eudocia, was seduced and enjoyed by Andronicus. Above the decencies of her sex and rank, she gloried in the name of his concubine, and both the palace and the camp could witness that she slept, or watched, in the arms of her lover. She accompanied him to his military command of Cilicia, the first scene of his valour and imprudence. He pressed, with active ardour, the siege of Mopsuestia. The day was employed in the boldest attacks, but the night was wasted in song and dance, and a band of Greek comedians formed the choicest part of his routine. Andronicus was surprised by the sally of a vigilant foe, but, while his troops fled in disorder, his invincible lance transpeared the thickest ranks of the Armenians. On his return to the imperial camp in Macedonia, he was received by Manuel with public smiles and a private reproof. But the duchies of Nasius, Branzabar, and Castoria were the reward or consolation of the unsuccessful general. Eudocia still attended his motions. At midnight their tent was suddenly attacked by her angry brothers, impatient to expiate her infamy in his blood. His daring spirit refused her advance 
and the disguise of a female habit. And boldly, starting from his couch, he drew his sword and cut his way through the numerous assassins. It was here that he first betrayed his ingratitude and treachery. He engaged in a treasonable correspondence with the king of Hungary and the German emperor, approached the royal tent at a suspicious hour with a drawn sword, and, under the mask of a Latin soldier, avowed an intention of revenge against a mortal foe, and imprudently praised the fleetness of his horse as an instrument of flight and safety. The monarch disassembled his suspicions, but, after the close of the campaign, Andronicus was arrested and strictly confined in a tower of the palace of Constantinople. In this prison he was left about twelve years, a most painful restraint, from which the thirst of action and pleasure perpetually urged him to escape. Alone and pensive, he perceived some broken bricks in a corner of the chamber, and gradually widened the passage, till he had explored a dark and forgotten recess. Into this hull he conveyed himself, and the remains of his provisions, replacing the bricks in their former position, and erasing with care the footsteps of his retreat. At the hour of the customary visit, his guards were amazed by the silence and solitude of the prison, and reported, with shame and fear, his incomprehensible flight. The gates of the palace and city were instantly shut, the strictest orders were dispatched into the provinces for the recovery of the fugitive, and his wife, on the suspicion of a pious act, was basely imprisoned in the same tower. At the dead of night she beheld a spectre. She recognized her husband. They shared their provisions, and a son was the fruit of these stolen interviews, which alleviated the tediousness of their confinement. In the custody of a woman, the vigilance of the keepers was insensibly relaxed, and the captive had accomplished his real escape, when he was discovered, brought back to Constantinople, and loaded with a double chain. At length he found the moment and the means of his deliverance. A boy, his domestic servant, intoxicated the guards, and obtained in wax the impression of the key. By the diligence of his friends, a similar key, with a bundle of ropes, was introduced into the prison, in the bottom of a hogshead. Andronicus employed, with industry and courage, the instruments of his safety, unlocked the doors, descended from the tower, concealed himself a day among the bushes, and scaled in the night the garden wall of the palace. A boat was stationed for his reception. He visited his own house, embraced his children, cast away his chain, mounted a fleet horse, and directed his rapid course towards the banks of the Danube. At Ancaeolus in Thrace, an intrepid friend supplied him with horses and money. He passed the river, traversed with speed the desert of Moldavia and the Carpathian hills, and had almost reached the town of Halix in the Polish Russia, when he was intercepted by a party of Wallachians who resolved to convey their important captive to Constantinople. His presence of mind again extracted him from danger. Under the pretense of sickness, he dismounted in the night, and was allowed to step aside from the troop. He planted in the ground his long staff, clothed it with his cap and upper garment, and, stealing into the wood, left a phantom to amuse, for some time, the eyes of the Wallachians. From Halix he was honourably conducted to Quio, the residence of the great duke. The subtle Greek soon obtained the esteem and confidence of Erosolus. His character could assume the manners of every climate, and the barbarians applauded his strength and courage in the chase of the elks and bears of the forest. In this northern region he deserved the forgiveness of Manuel, who solicited the Russian prince who solicited the Russian prince to join his arms in the invasion of Hungary. The influence of Andronicus achieved this important service. His private treaty was signed with the promise of fidelity on one side, and of oblivion on the other. And he marched, at the head of the Russian cavalry, from the Borosthenes to the Danube. 
In his reinstatement, Manuel had ever sympathized with the martial and dissolute character of his cousin, and his free pardon was sealed in the assault of Zemlin, in which he was second, and second only, to the valor of the emperor. No sooner was the exile restored to freedom and his country than his ambition revived, at first to his own, and at length to the public misfortune. A daughter of Manuel was a feeble bar to the succession of the more deserving males of the Comemnian blood. Her future marriage with the Prince of Hungary was repugnant to the hopes or prejudices of the princes and nobles. But when an oath of allegiance was required to the presumptive heir, Andronicus alone asserted the honour of the Roman name, declined the unlawful engagement, and boldly protested against the adoption of a stranger. His patriotism was offensive to the emperor, but he spoke the sentiments of the people, and was removed from the royal presence by an honourable banishment, a second command of the Sicilian frontier, with the absolute disposal of the revenues of Cyprus. In this station the Armenians again exercised his courage and exposed his negligence, and the same rebel, who baffled all his operations, was unhorsed and almost slain by the vigour of his lance. But Andronicus soon discovered a more easy and pleasing conquest. The beautiful Philippa, sister of the Empress Maria, and daughter of Raymond of and daughter of Raymond of Poitio, the Latin prince of Antioch. For her sake he deserted his station, and wasted the summer in balls and tournaments. To his love she sacrificed her innocence, her reputation, and the offer of an advantageous marriage. But the resentment of Manuel for this domestic affront interrupted his pleasures. Andronicus left the indiscreet princess to weep and to repent, and, with a band of desperate adventurers, undertook the pilgrimage of Jerusalem. His birth, his martial renown, and professions of zeal, announced him as the champion of the cross. He soon captivated both the clergy and the king, and the Greek prince was invested with the lordship of Eretus on the coast of Phoenicia. In his neighbourhood resided a young and handsome queen of his own nation and family, great-granddaughter of the emperor Alexis, and widow of Baldwin the Third, king of Jerusalem. She visited and loved her kinsman. Theodora was the third victim of his amorous seduction, and her shame was more public and scandalous than that of her predecessors. The emperor still thirsted for revenge, and his subjects and allies of the Syrian frontier were repeatedly pressed to seize the person and put out the eyes of the fugitive. In Palestine he was no longer safe, but the tender Theodora revealed his danger and accompanied his flight. The queen of Jerusalem was exposed to the east, his obi his obsequious concubine, and two illegitimate children were the living monuments of her weakness. Damascus was his first refuge, and in the characters of the great Noradin and his servant Saladin, the superstitious Greek might learn to revere the virtues of the Mussulmans. As a friend of Noradin, he visited, most probably, Baghdad, and the courts of Persia, and, after a long circuit round the Caspian Sea and the mountains of Georgia, he finally settled among the Turks of Asia Minor, the hereditary enemies of his country. The Sultan of Colonia afforded a hospitable retreat to Andronicus, his mistress, and his band of outlaws. The debt of gratitude was repaid by frequent inroads in the Roman province of Trebizond, and he seldom returned without an ample harvest of spoil and of Christian captives. In the story of his adventures, he was fond of comparing himself to David, who escaped, by a long exile, the snares of the wicked. But the royal prophet, he presumed to add, was content to lurk on the borders of Judea, to slay an Amalekite, and to threaten, in his miserable state, the life of the avaricious Nabal. The excursions of the Comemnian prince had a wider range, and he had spread over the eastern world the glory of his name and religion. 
by a sentence of the Greek church, the licentious rover had been separated from the faithful. But even this excommunication may prove that he never abjured the profession of Christianity. His vigilance had eluded or repelled the open and secret persecution of the emperor. But he was at length ensnared by the captivity of his female companion. The governor of Trebizond succeeded in his attempt to surprise the person of Theodora. The queen of Jerusalem and her two children were sent to Constantinople, and their loss embittered the tedious solitude of banishment. The fugitive implored and obtained a final pardon, with leave to throw himself at the feet of his sovereign, who was satisfied with the submission of this haughty spirit. Prostrate on the ground, he deplored with tears and groans the guilt of his past rebellion. Nor would he presume to arise unless some faithful subject would drag him to the foot of the throne, by an iron chain with which he had secretly encircled his neck. This extraordinary penance excited the wonder and pity of the assembly. His sins were forgiven by the church and state, but the just suspicion of Manuel fixed his residence at a distance from the court. At Onoe, a town of Pontus, surrounded with rich vineyards, and situate on the coast of the Euxin. The death of Manuel, and the disorders of the minority, soon opened the fairest field to his ambition. The emperor was a boy of twelve or fourteen years of age, without vigour or wisdom or experience. His mother, the Empress Mary, abandoned her person and government to a favourite of the Comnenian name, and his sister, another Mary, whose husband, an Italian, was decorated with the title of Caesar, excited a conspiracy, and at length an insurrection, against her odious stepmother. The provinces were forgotten, the capital was in flames, and a century of peace and order was overthrown in the vice and weakness of a few months. A civil war was kindled in Constantinople. The two factions fought a bloody battle in the square of the palace, and the rebels sustained a regular siege in the cathedral of St. Sophia. The patriarch labelled with honest zeal to heal the wounds of the republic. The most respectable patriots called aloud for a guardian and avenger, and every tongue repeated the praise of the talents and even the virtues of Andronicus. In his retirement, he affected to revolve the solemn duties of his oath. If the safety or honour of the imperial family be threatened, I will reveal and oppose the mischief to the utmost of my power. His correspondence with the patriarch and patricians was seasoned with apt quotations from the Psalms of David and the epistles of St. Paul and he patiently waited till he was called to her deliverance by the voice of his country. In his march from Onoe to Constantinople, his slender train insensibly swelled to a crowd and an army. His professions of religion and loyalty were mistaken for the language of his heart, and the simplicity of a foreign dress, which showed to an advantage his majestic stature, displayed a lively image of his poverty and exile. All opposition sank before him. He reached the straits of the Thracian Bosphorus. The Byzantine navy sailed from the harbour to receive and transport the saviour of the empire. The torrent was loud and irresistible. And the insects, who had basked in the sunshine of royal favour, disappeared at the blast of the storm. It was the first care of Andronicus to occupy the palace, to salute the emperor, to confine his mother, to punish her minister, and to restore the public order and tranquillity. He then visited the sepulchre of Manuel. The spectators were ordered to stand aloof, but as he bowed in the attitude of prayer, they heard, or thought they heard, a murmur of triumph or revenge. I no longer fear thee, my old enemy, who has driven me a vagabond to every climate of the earth. Thou art safely deposited under a sevenfold dome, from whence thou can never arise, to the signal of the last trumpet. It is now my turn, and speedily will I trample on thy ashes and thy posterity. 
From his subsequent tyranny, we may impute such feelings to the man and the moment. But it is not extremely probable that he gave an articulate sound to his secret thoughts. In the first months of his administration, his designs were veiled by a fair semblance of hypocrisy, which could delude only the eyes of the multitude. The coronation of Alexius was performed with due solemnity, and his perfidious guardian, holding in his hands the body and blood of Christ, most fervently declared that he lived, and was ready to die, for the service of his beloved pupil. But his numerous adherents were instructed to maintain that the sinking empire must perish in the hands of a child, that the Romans could only be served by a veteran prince, bold in arms, skilful in policy, and taught to reign by the long experience of fortune and mankind, and that it was the duty of every citizen to force the reluctant modesty of Andronicus to undertake the burden of the public care. The young emperor was himself constrained to join his voice to the general acclamation, and to solicit the association of a colleague, who instantly degraded him from the supreme rank, secluded his person, and verified the rough declaration of the patriarch, that Alexius might be considered as dead, so soon as he was committed to the custody of his guardian. But his death was preceded by the imprisonment and execution of his mother, after blackening her reputation, and inflaming against her the passions of the multitude, the tyrant accused and tried the empress for a treasonable correspondence with the king of Hungary. His own son, a youth of honour and humanity, avowed his abhorrence of this flagatious act, and three of the judges had the merit of preferring their conscience to their safety. But the obsequious tribunal, without requiring any reproof, or hearing any defence, condemned the widow of Manuel, and her unfortunate son subscribed the sentence of her death. Maria was strangled, her corpse was buried in the sea, and her memory was wounded by the insult most offensive to female vanity, a false and ugly representation of her beauteous form. The fate of her son was no longer deferred. He was strangled with a bowstring, and the tyrant, insensible to pity or remorse, after surveying the body of the innocent youth, struck it rudely with his foot. "'Thy father,' he cried, "'was a knave, thy mother a whore, and thyself a fool.' The Roman sceptre, the reward of his crimes, was held by Andronicus about three years and a half, as the guardian or sovereign of the empire." his government exhibited a singular contrast of vice and virtue. When he listened to his passions, he was a scourge. When he consulted his reason, the father of his people. In the exercise of private justice, he was equitable and rigorous. A shameful and pernicious venalty was abolished, and the offices were filled with the most deserving candidates, by a prince who had sense to choose, and severity to punish. He prohibited the inhumane practice of pillaging the goods and persons of shipwrecked mariners. The provinces, so long the objects of oppression or neglect, revived in prosperity and plenty, and millions applauded the distant blessings of his reign, while he was cursed by the witnesses of his daily cruelties. The ancient proverb, that bloodthirsty is the man who returns from banishment to power, had been applied with too much truth, to Marius and Tiberius, and was now verified for the third time in the life of Andronicus. His memory was stored with a black list of the enemies and rivals, who had traduced his merit, opposed his greatness, or insulted his misfortunes. And the only comfort of his exile was a sacred hope and promise of revenge. The necessary extinction of the young emperor and his mother imposed the fatal obligation of extirpating the friends, who hated, and might punish, the assassin, and the repetition of murder rendered him less willing and less able to forgive. A horrid narrative of the victims who he sacrificed by poison or the sword, by the sea or the flames, would be less expressive of his cruelty 
than the appellation of the halcyon days, which was applied to a rare and bloodless week of repose. The tyrant strove to transfer, on the laws and judges, some portion of his guilt. But the mask was fallen, and his subjects could no longer mistake the true author of their calamities. The noblest of the Greeks, most especially those, by descent or alliance, might dispute the Comnenian inheritance, escaped from the monster's den. Nice and Prusa, Sicily or Cyprus, were their places of refuge, and as their flight was already criminal, they aggravated their offence by an open revolt and the imperial title. Yet Andronicus resisted the daggers and swords of his most formidable enemies. Nice and Prusa were reduced and chastised. The Sicilians were content with the sack of Thessalonica, and the distance of Cyprus was no more propitious to the rebel than to the tyrant. His throne was subverted by a rival without merit, and a people without arms. Isaac and Jealous, a descendant in the female line from the great Alexius, was marked as a victim by the prudence or superstition of the emperor. In a moment of despair, Angelus defended his life and liberty, slew the executioner, and fled to the church of St. Sophia. The sanctuary was insensibly filled with a curious and mournful crowd, who, in his fate, prognosticated their own. But their lamentations were soon turned to curses, and their curses to threats. They dared to ask, Why do we fear? Why do we obey? We are many, and he is one. Our patience is the only bond of our slavery. With the dawn of day, the city burst into great sedition. The prisons were thrown open. The coldest and most servile were roused to the defence of their country. And Isaac, the second of the name, was raised from the sanctuary to the throne. Unconscious of his danger, the tyrant was absent, withdrawn from the toils of state, in the delicious isles of the Propontis. He had contracted an indecent marriage with Alice, or Agnes, daughter of Louis the Seventh of France, and relicit of the unfortunate Alexius. And his society, more suitable to his temper than to his age, was composed of a young wife and a favourite concubine. On the first alarm he rushed to Constantinople, impatient for the blood of the guilty. But he was astonished by the silence of the palace, the tumult of the city, and the general desertion of mankind. Andronicus proclaimed a free pardon to his subjects. They neither desired nor would grant forgiveness. He offered to resign the crown to his son Manuel, but the virtues of the son could not expiate his father's crimes. The sea was still open for his retreat, but the news of the revolution had flown along the coast. When fear had ceased, obedience was no more. The imperial galley was pursued and taken by an armed brigantine, and the tyrant was dragged to the presence of Isaac and Jealous, loaded with fetters and a long chain round his neck. His eloquence and the tears of his female companions pleaded in vain for his life. But, instead of the decencies of a legal execution, the new monarch abandoned the criminal to the numerous sufferers, whom he had deprived of a father, a husband, or a friend. His teeth and hair, an eye and a hand, were torn from him, as a poor compensation for their loss, and a short respite was allowed, that he might feel the bitterness of death. Astride on a camel, without any danger of a rescue, he was carried through the city, and the basest of the populace rejoiced to trample on the fallen majesty of their prince. After a thousand blows and outrages, Andronicus was hung by the feet between two pillars, that supported the statues of a wolf and a sow. And every hand that could reach the public enemy inflicted on his body some mark of ingenious or brutal cruelty, till two friendly or furious Italians plunged their swords into his body, 
released him from all human punishment. In this long and painful agony, Lord, have mercy upon me, and why will you bruise a broken reed, were the only words that escaped from his mouth. Our hatred for the tyrant is lost in pity for the man. Nor can we blame his pusillanimous resignation, since a Greek Christian was no longer master of his life. I have been tempted to expatiate on the extraordinary character and adventures of Andronicus, but I shall here terminate the series of the Greek emperors since the time of Heraclius. The branches that sprung from the Comimnian trunk had insensibly withered, and the male line was continued only in the posterity of Andronicus himself, who, in the public confusion, usurped the sovereignty of Trezebond, so obscure in history, and so famous in romance. A private citizen of Philadelphia, Constantine Angelus, has emerged to wealth and honours by his marriage with the daughter of the emperor Alexius. His son Andronicus is conspicuous only by his cowardice. His grandson Isaac punished and succeeded the tyrant, but he was dethroned by his own vices and the ambition of his brother and their discord introduced the Latins to the conquest of Constantinople, the first great period in the fall of the Eastern Empire. If we compute the number and duration of the reigns, it will be found that a period of six hundred years is filled by sixty emperors, including, in the Augustian line, some female sovereigns, and, deducting some usurpers who were never acknowledged in the capital, and some princes who did not live to possess their inheritance. The average proportion will allow ten years for each emperor, far below the chronological rule of Sir Isaac Newton, who, from the experience of more recent and regular monarchies, has defined about eighteen or twenty years as the term of an ordinary reign. The Byzantine Empire was most tranquil and prosperous when it could acquiesce in hereditary succession. Five dynasties, the Heraclean, Isaurian, Amorian, Basilean, and Comemnian families, enjoyed and transmitted the royal patrimony during their respected series of five, four, three, six, and four generations. Several princes numbered the years of their reign and those of their infancy. And Constantine the Seventh and his two grandsons occupy the space of an entire century. But in the intervals of the Byzantine dynasties, the succession is rapid and broken, and the name of a successful candidate is speedily erased by a more fortunate competitor. Many were the paths that led to the summit of royalty. The fabric of rebellion was overthrown by the stroke of conspiracy, or undermined by the silent arts of intrigue. The favourites of the soldiers or people, of the senate or clergy, of the women and eunuchs, were alternatively clothed with the purple. The means of their elevation were base, and their end was often contemptible or tragic. A being of the nature of man, endowed with the same facilities, but with a longer measure of existence, would cast down a smile of pity and contempt on the crimes and follies of human ambition, so eager in a narrow span, to grasp at a precarious and short-lived enjoyment. It is thus that the experience of history exalts and enlarges the horizon of our intellectual view. In a composition of some days, in a perusal of some hours, six hundred years have rolled away, and the duration of a life or reign is contracted to a fleeting moment. The grave is ever beside the throne. The success of a criminal is almost instantly followed by the loss of his prize and our immortal reason survives and disdains the sixty phantoms of kings who have passed before our eyes, and faintly dwell on our remembrance. The observation that, in every age and climate, ambition has prevailed with the same commanding energy, may abate the surprise of a philosopher. But while he condemns the vanity, he may search the motive of this universal desire to hold and obtain the sceptre of dominion. To the greater part of the Byzantine series, we cannot reasonably ascribe the love of fame and of mankind. 
The virtue alone of John Comnenus was beneficent and pure. The most illustrious of the princes, who precede or follow that respectable name, have trod with some dexterity and vigour the crooked and bloody paths of a selfish policy. In scrutinising the imperfect characters of Leo the Asaurian, Basil I, and Alexius Comnenus, of Theophilus, the second Basil, and Manuel Comnenus, our esteem and censure are almost equally balanced, and the remainder of the imperial crowd could only desire and expect to be forgotten by posterity. Was personal happiness the aim and object of their ambition? I shall not discant on the vulgar topics of the misery of kings, but I may surely observe that their condition, of all others, is the most pregnant with fear and the least susceptible of hope. For these opposite passions a larger scope was allowed in the revolutions of antiquity than in the smooth and solid temper of the modern world, which cannot easily repeat either the triumph of Alexander or the fall of Darius. But the peculiar infelicity of the Byzantine princes exposed them to domestic perils, without affording any lively promise of foreign conquest. From the pinnacles of greatness, Andronicus was precipitated by a death more cruel and shameful than that of the malefactor. But the most glorious of his predecessors had much more to dread from their subjects than to hope from their enemies. The army was licentious without spirit, the nation turbulent without freedom, the barbarians of the east and west pressed on the monarchy, and the loss of the provinces was terminated by the final servitude of the capital. The entire series of Roman emperors, from the first of the Caesars to the last of the Constantines, extends above fifteen hundred years, and the term of dominion, unbroken by foreign conquests, surpasses the measure of the ancient monarchies, the Assyrians or Medes, the successors of Sirius, or those of Alexander. End of chapter 48, part 5 End of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 4, by Edward Gibbon.